Jesus said, I am the resurrection and I am life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, yet shall they live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I hold the keys of hell and death. Because I live, you shall live also. Friends and family, we have gathered today, and it's a beautiful day, but we have gathered today to give thanks, to give thanks for a wonderful life. And as we come together today, we also know this is a time of worship together. So we pray that as we witness to our faith and as we witness to the life of Roy, that as we come together in grief, acknowledging our loss, that God would grant us hope. That in a time of despair, God would grant us comfort. And in a time of turmoil, God would grant us peace. Peace of Christ that surpasses all understanding. Would you join me now as we pray together the prayer found in your bulletin? O oh God, death has come, and a friend is taken from us. In a shared sense of loss, we gather before you, O oh God. You have the words of life. Where else can we go? You are the beginning and end of all things. You alone can call us from the grave to life. Strengthen our faith in your promises. Be that holy presence who fills emptiness. Speak to still the troubling wind and storm within us. As you rose from death to life, we also rise in you. In the name of the risen Jesus, we pray. Amen. A favorite hymn of Roy's is Blessed Assurance, number 369 in your hymn book. I invite those who are able to stand as we sing that. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. 
Hear now some selected readings from John chapter 14. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. I have said these things to you while I am still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not let them be afraid. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, may the words of my mouth this afternoon and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you. Amen. You know, yesterday I was meeting with some of the family and and Tabitha shared a word with me that has been on my mind since yesterday morning. The word is steady. Steady. In times of loss, I don't know about you, but I tend to turn to things that steady me, that give me some foundation, some support. My mom used to call it comfort food. I need that comfort. We turn to family and friends to steady our feelings. We turn to familiar hymns, songs, scriptures, prayers. One of those passages is John chapter 14. For these words are part of a discourse that Jesus gave to his disciples to steady them. For they did not fully understand what was about to happen. What do you mean, Jesus, you go to this place that you prepare? What do you mean, peace that you're giving to me? You're going to always be with us, Jesus. What do you mean by this? Jesus knew what he was doing. These were the last major words that he would give his disciples before the cross here on earth. It's not Jesus' last words. Of course, in the cross he has last words. And then when he appears to them later on after he's resurrected, he has last words for them. And then... We have the last words of the vision of John in Revelation. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. We just, we just started our service with those words. But these are steady words. Words we need to hear in difficult times. And there are no, no doubt that these words from John 14 bring us comfort. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not let them be afraid. He promises to give us peace. Jesus says, in my Father's house there are many dwelling places. He's prepared a place for us. Doesn't that sound like good news? And you see, I think for many of us who knew Roy, because Roy understood that. He believed that. He looked forward to that day. Jesus speaks of in this passage. I have thoughts on what it means that Jesus has prepared a place for us. I'm sure you have thoughts on what that means and what that looks like. But for one thing, I know that Jesus was seen through the life of Roy in the ways that he lived. I think his kindness, his humility, 
His perception of the beauty of God's creation were ways that we saw Jesus in Roy. Haley shared that when she was little, that your dad would hold your hand when you were sick. And with a pained expression, he would say to you, I wish I could trade places with you. If I could, I would do it in a heartbeat. You see, that's what the uh, Greek New Testament calls agape love. Agape love. In the English, we have one word for love. We use it for everything. But in the Bible, the New Testament, written in that Greek, there's lots of different words for love. But one of them is the strongest word. And that's agape love. A selfless, sacrificial love. No matter what, you are going to love. A love that will love you without anything in return. It's the same word that shows up in that familiar passage. Some of you may have it on your walls at home. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That is agape love. It's the same love Paul uses in his letter to a divided Corinthian church. Remember he says to them, love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. It does not boast. Know the word he used? Agape love. We quote this verse a lot at weddings. We probably should quote it more at funerals. Earlier I mentioned to you that John 14 has a steadying effect on us. Especially our emotions when we lose someone we love. The disciples were about to lose Jesus. They, they didn't really understand what was about to happen. But Jesus was preparing them for a new chapter in their life as disciples. When I think of um, the last couple of years, really the last several months especially, Roy was in a different chapter in his life. It was a difficult chapter because he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And that's extremely difficult for any family to have a loved one go through. Haley mentioned that the diagnosis revealed some things to her and her family. Lessons about life and love. The deeper spiritual meaning behind what challenges and obstacles in life bring us. She says that what Alzheimer's thought that it could take away from a family actually revealed a fuller sense of Roy's life and his purpose. You see, before Roy's diagnosis, Roy had accomplished more in a lifetime than many of us could dream of. In addition to being a a caretaker to his own family at an early age, Roy was a provider. He provided for his family, his beloved church here. He provided for his employees throughout the years. He provided for this community. And in doing so, he provided us a wonderful legacy of a life well lived and a life well loved. Jane told me that... uh, She hit a home run when she met Roy. You all began dating at the old Holston High School, right? You called him Mr. Holston High School, right? And you all were quite young. We won't share the age there, right? 1965, I think. Jane says that there was a lot of competition out there for someone like Roy Adams. But I don't think she was too concerned. She knew she had a good shot. Not long after they were dating, Roy's father passed away, and Roy was only 18 years old. In 1969, Roy and Jane married, and you have had a beautiful 54 years together. Now, when it came to marriage, and Roy would share this often, he had a secret he would share with you, and he would tell you it was two words when it came to marriage. And I know many of you know exactly what I'm about to say. He would say, yes, dear. (laughs) You know, we say, yes, dear. I say, yes, dear, to my wife. And a lot of times it's more about, yes, dear, you're right. I will say this to keep the peace. But you know, Roy said, yes, dear. We know what he meant. He meant, I love you. I trust you. I will advocate for you. I will embody the vows that I made in a marriage covenant. 
That's what Roy meant. And Jane, you've done the same for your husband in this last chapter especially. You have cared for him. You have advocated for him. You were always by his side, even in those last difficult months. And God gave you the strength to say to Roy, yes, dear. I mentioned earlier that those words of John 14 or Psalm 23, and we all have our songs and stuff that they help steady us in moments like this when we feel that void of death of someone we love. And that's true today. But I remember that Jesus spoke those words to his disciples. And, and I remember the whole Bible narrative tells us that when there's obstacles and challenges in life, God always takes care of God's people. Jesus did this. He took care of his disciples. He even took care of the crowds. And they were hungry. And he only had a few loaves and fishes. But not only did Jesus take care of them, he had plenty of abundance left over. And I feel that today, the abundance of the leftover of love that Roy shared in this room to the people that are here, which leads me to my final thoughts about Roy, and that's his faith in his Lord Jesus Christ. Roy's faith was a faith in a God of abundance. Roy's faith was in a Christ whose peace does surpass all understanding. Roy's faith was in the community of faith where he could live out his faith in Jesus right here in this place. I don't know if some of you know the name John Wesley, any Methodist in here. He founded a revival movement in the Church of England in the mid-1700s. Some of you remember it. Roy's ancestors would actually, decades later, after the founding of that movement, would found a church right here in Blountville called Ake of Chapel. You've probably driven by it. And Ake of Chapel, still right off of 126, dates back to the 1780s. And after about 100 years, they said, this has been a one-room schoolhouse. It's been a, a church. We need to build something else. So they built what is now the Adams Chapel. Any Adams Chapel people here today? All right. Adams Chapel has the distinction of being the oldest continuing Methodist church in the state of Tennessee. It's got the Adams name on it, right? When jo jo Roy and Jane were married, I know Roy served in a lot of ways here in this church. He, um, he served in um, generous ways, trustees, church council, always willing to help. Even staff parish. Whew, poor Roy. But I'm grateful to have known Roy these last six years of his life in his faith journey. He was such a blessing uh, to the people here. And you know how I know that? You know how I know that Roy was kind and humble? Because I went out and played golf with him at Graysburg Hills. <laughs> and let me tell you something. You learn a lot about people when you play golf with them. You learn just how kind and humble they are when they slice that shot off into the woods. Roy just smiled and continued on. And I said, I want to be like that when I play golf. Now, earlier I, I spoke about Jesus' words to his disciples about going and preparing a place for us. And, and I have to share this because last week when Roy began to exhibit uh, signs to his loved ones that something was happening, you know, something was different, he began to speak about his mother and his brother, and he spoke multiple times about them, and even shared that they were nearby with him. And the night before he died, Roy whispered a prayer on his own. Now, we would go and pray and say the Lord's Prayer, and he would join in, but Roy had said a prayer on his own, and the prayer was in a whisper, Lord, let me go in peace. He slept all night in that recliner, and in the morning, he got out of that recliner several times. And at one point, he said, I gotta go, didn't he, Crystal? I gotta go. And you thought, well, he's gotta go to the facilities here. We'll get you up and go. He wasn't talking about that. He got up and he headed toward the door, and he wanted to go out. 
to what was next, to what lies ahead, to that new chapter. And well, he went, and it wasn't minutes later that Roy's heart, a heart full of so much love and agape, it went out. And he transitioned from this place to the next. Roy went home. Roy is now home. A home not built with human hands, but one that is eternal in the heavens. And how fitting it is that he went home in the morning, his favorite time of day. He loved the sunrises. And something about the sunrise reminds us that the darkness is over. Light has come, and it's time to begin again. Haley put it this way. She said, During my father's time on earth, he demonstrated what we all yearn to know about the father's love. The father's love is unconditional, is forgiving, is always patient and kind and present in a bond that cannot be broken by distance, by time, by disease, nor by death. Medically, I can surmise what may have happened to result in my dad's cardiac arrest. Spiritually, I understand it to mean something deeper. During his time on earth, he had given us all the love he could possibly give, and it was his time to be called into heaven so that his heart would now receive all the love he had given, an eternal love. He prayed to God that he would die without feeling pain, and his final prayer was answered. When he was called, he answered the call. Indeed, when Roy was called, he answered the call. He vivified the call, and his life remains a testimony for you and I so that we too might live in that call to follow Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Well, I fear that Roy right now is gazing down and thinking, who in the world thought it was a good idea to give her a captive audience and a microphone? <laughs> I have not only permission, but a request from the family to be lighthearted, just so you know. And it's a good thing, because I'm not sure I know any other way. Good afternoon, I'm Michelle Bacon. 
It is my distinct honor and privilege to be asked by this beautiful family to share during this time of witness and truly celebrate Roy's life. I had the unique opportunity to observe him in his personal life, his community life, his church life, and in business. Not only did I work for him for 17 years, but he also introduced me to his beautiful family. See, they were my family when I didn't have a family here. My family was far, far away, and I was young and not so wise, and I was so grateful. And Tabitha and I have continued a relationship and a friendship that I'm so grateful for. We've had the opportunity to minister together, work together, and I just can't tell you how wonderful it is the way God weaves people in and out of your life. So how do you adequately, adequately describe somebody's life in such a brief amount of time? You don't. You really, you can't. You see, I can't ever generate enough words to help you understand the impact that Roy had. But we've all experienced it. Many of us have our own fond memories, our own unique perspectives on exactly who he was. And whether you experienced him personally or you're here because you love somebody in this family, you still experienced him. You see, the traits that he embodied, they exist right here in this gorgeous family. And what a beautiful legacy he left behind for all of us. If you'll allow me, I'm going to summarize at least a portion of his obituary. And the Reverend did such a beautiful job of cap capturing so many of these things. But the people that wrote this are the ones that loved him the most and knew him the best. He has been a part of this community for a very long time, and he loved it with everything in him. He was so proud to be a graduate of Holston High School, and I heard several of you say, I was his classmate. He loved the fact that he went to ETSU and had a degree in industrial technology. I love the fact that his beginnings, as he mentioned, with Adams Chapel and his family and their ancestors, that they were a part of exactly who he was going to be designed to become. And after he retired in 2012, owning two family-owned businesses, Little and Adams and A&L Construction, he really did value those relationships that he forged with all of us, the employees, the colleagues. He was definitely the first one there and the last one to leave. He served so many ways in so many different community um, events and served in leadership roles. He also served us through the Tennessee National Guard. He truly did enjoy watching things grow. We talked about nature, flowers, vegetables, but he also loved watching people grow, and that's what he gave so many of us an opportunity to do. I hope you've seen the pictures around the display of him enjoying time fishing, hunting, but you know what he enjoyed the very most and what brought him the most joy was this family. He loved them so very much. And when we watched him move from dad to pops, you could see the elation on his face when he talked about you all. I got to watch him observe you play basketball in that very gym. I got to see him watch you in the play, and I saw how his heart would just swell with pride. It was such a delight, and there were so many beautiful memories made. He did live out his Christian faith, just exactly as you said. He was a man of principles, and he definitely stood up for what he believed in. Those values of integrity, honesty, compassion, and kindness to everybody that he met. And his beautiful wife, Jane. Loving wife for 54 years. And I would be so remiss if I didn't stop right here and say, I'm so inspired by the complete unwavering commitment, the love, and the care that you gave to him. Your marriage was an example of exactly what it means in the Bible when it talks about unconditional love. We know that you all were one. That was evident. Where you saw one, you saw the other. And God was always in the middle. And that's not something you ever had to wonder or question about. They displayed the ultimate respect, support, and love for one another. And who in here wouldn't love to experience that? Thank you. Thank you for that example. He loved his girls. He loved Tabitha and Haley so very much, and Sean. Sean and I were talking about how many wonderful activities they got to enjoy together. And these grandbabies, as you well know, goodness, Henry, Tilly, Gabby, Jacob, and Hannah, his niece who's going to speak next, um, her husband Joseph, and Cahill, and Rachel, and so many other cousins and family members and friends. That's just a small snapshot of his life. 
And when I read that, what stood out to you? What was it that resonated? Was it the fact that he was truly a servant leader? That he walked out his life demonstrating his love for God and being obedient to God's word in everything that he did? Or maybe it was how he loved his family and how he loved Jane and how he would light up even when she walked in the room towards the very end. See, this de disease did strip some things away. But no matter what, just as it was said earlier, it couldn't take away who Roy was. He lived a virtuous life, and how do we know that? We're told that if you look at a man's life and see what fruit it bears, it will tell you what you need to know. And when I looked at the fruits of the Spirit, Roy embodied every single one of those and demonstrated those for us. Now, was he perfect? No, he was a human being just like us. But through his daily example of living, even through the smallest daily task, he was true to who God had called him to be. I mentioned that I worked for him at A&L Industrial, for he and his family. And what I remember most about him was that he was one of the most patient men I had ever met. And that worked out pretty good for me because I came in in my early 20s a little bit sassy, a little bit hard to deal with, maybe not always displaying the fruits of the Spirit as he did. We were a contract company that you're aware of that, and a few short weeks after I had begun working there, I realized that some people had been charging to one of my jobs, and I didn't like that because I knew they hadn't been there. So I asked them, I said, who do you all, who do you all report to? They said, Roy. I looked his number up and I called him, told him what was going on, and he patiently listened on the other end of the phone. He said, I'm going to come to your office and look at this documentation. We hung up the phone and a coworker spun around and she said, who in the world did you just call, Michelle? I said, I called some man named Roy. He's on his way over here. <laughs> they said, that's fantastic. He's the owner of the company. I was like, well, that's one way to get to know him. He sat and he looked at the documentation and he looked me in the eye and he said, we will never charge somebody for work that we did not do. I'm going to take care of this immediately. And that's what I saw Roy do consistently over time. He would make the wrong things right. He knew that it was important. If you're in business or if you deal with people, then you know there's going to be issues, right? That's what human beings do. I could tell you countless stories about things that we faced together. I could tell you the names the specifics, but none of those things mattered. That wasn't what is, was important. What was important was how Roy handled it time after time, how he responded, how he reacted consistently and fairly and for the greater good. And he always kept in mind that he wanted to care for the employees and the customers first, and that had to be first. And he would tell me, if you do the right things for the right reasons, the rest will take care of itself. Sometime later in my appointment, he walked in one afternoon to our office, and as the obituary told you, he was the first one and the last one to leave. See, he showed us his work ethic, not through his words, but simply by his example. But he walked in, and he looked over at me, and he started shaking his head. And I looked up, and I said, what's the matter, Roy? He said, I never know if I'm going to walk in here and find you dressed to the nines, ready to go present to the CEO of our customer, or if you're going to look like you've been in a dog fight. I was laying on the floor with blueprints rolled out and I was scaling off something and he was right. My hair was tucked up in a pencil. My jewelry was on one side, pantyhose probably over here, shoes over there, stuff everywhere. But the beautiful thing about it was we were very opposite in our personalities, but we worked so well together. And as much as I love to talk and love to deal with people, he very much valued his alone time, his quiet time at a drafting table. One day I came barging into his office, a little bit animated, wanting answers right away, probably doing my hands on his desk, something like this. That didn't always go well for me, by the way. And, um, you know, he's, I noticed that he started backing his chair up. And when I finally took a breath, he said, Michelle, do you see the door behind me? And I said, yes, sir. And he said, I have the carpenters put that in so that when you come down the hallway and I can see you, I can go out the back door and escape. <laughs> We both started to laugh because we both knew it was a joke, I think, sort of, <laughs> sort of, maybe not. But as a young professional, I had that front row seat to watch how this man ran his company. He instilled safety first. That wasn't a slogan. That is the way that we ran that business. He knew that employees needing to go home to their families and support them were what mattered. 
I want you to think about for a minute how many people in this community, Roy and this family, provided employment for. Mine was one of them. When I say there were literally thousands of mouths that had been fed because of what they did, that is no exaggeration. Hours, dollars, sweat equity, you name it, they put that back into this community. And do you think for one minute they did it for recognition, for advancement? I can assure you they didn't. That's not why they did it. They ran that business, and when decisions were made, we sat around a table together where he would say, if the decision that we're about to make doesn't match the words on that wall of our mission and our vision and our core values, we won't do it. And he stood by that. Some of us have been talking about stories that we walked around this afternoon, and we said, there aren't companies really that do that anymore, quite frankly, or not many that we've seen. We truly worked for a family. We were part of that family. Business can say all day long, we're a family. But I can tell you, if you experience it firsthand, you know when it's real. Humility was the essence of who he was and, his, and who they are now. And even after that disease had progressed, I understand that they would put a meal in front of him and he would sit and wait. And they would tell him, Roy, go ahead and eat. But he would wait because he was like, I'm waiting for whoever is coming to join me because that's the kind of gentleman that he was. Or he might say, maybe I need to save some of this for somebody else that might need it. You see, he knew to be a good steward of the provisions that God had given to him. He wouldn't take anything that was not his. Integrity is what you do when nobody else is looking. And towards the end of his life, there was a situation where he could see some of his belongings in a closet and he asked either um, Jane or Tabitha, are those mine? And they confirmed, yes, they were. But he wouldn't retrieve them because he said, I don't have permission yet from the client to do that. See, that's integrity. People can talk about embodying a value, but when a person demonstrates those values, even when they have forgotten so many other things, just wow. Talk about walking out a virtuous life. And although he was one of the hardest working men you would ever meet, he never sought out the spotlight and he didn't want the credit or the attention. He knew that even though he worked hard, that that wasn't necessary to get into the kingdom, that it wasn't about his works. It was about the position of his heart. It was about having Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. You see, he didn't talk about these things. He simply was an obedient servant in all circumstances. His motives were true and pure. He knew his identity in Christ, and he understood that identity had nothing to do with outcomes, performances, achievements, although he had many, just as the Reverend mentioned earlier. He understood that that identity was walked out despite any circumstance. He was not a prideful person, but he was very proud. And make mo no mistake, those are two very different things. He had that good-natured smile. You've seen it in these pictures today. Oh, and let him start talking about one of these grandbabies or one of his daughter's accomplishments. Um, you could just see him just full of love and joy. I remember one day I pulled into the parking lot down here in Colonial Heights um, in front of Ingalls. I had two small children, stressed out mom, last minute buying my tree. I know everybody's shocked. Um, and the man turned around to help me, and lo and behold, it was Roy smiling at me. He talked to my children, he got them to calm down, he helped me pick out a tree, he put it on top of the car and secured it. And the whole time in my mind, I'm thinking, that's not right for the owner of the company to be helping me and assisting me. But that's just who he was, that's what he did. He showed people that he cared. One of his favorite things was to be engaged with his employees. One of his favorite employees, Bill Kidd, the two of them would stand around and talk about their mater plants and how they wanted to have another mater sandwich party. He really did love the simple things. He wanted to stop and celebrate achievements and accomplishments that we had. And he would go to safety celebrations and he'd say, Michelle, I really don't want to talk. I just want to stand behind the line, shake their hand, thank them, serve them food. He would listen to their personal stories and you could tell that he really enjoyed every minute of it. You see, I can still see his sweet smile. I can still recall his calm demeanor and I tried it a lot, I promise you. <laughs> I enjoyed serving alongside of him. He impacted me with his, with his humility. I enjoyed watching him being fully present. 
thanking people and letting you know that you truly did matter. An important part of his legacy can really be summarized in a poem that his father-in-law used to regularly share with us. And although I'm not as sharp as Mr. P. Tom Little, who I also loved, I don't have it committed to memory the way that he did. It is still etched on my heart. It's called The Bridge Builder. An old man going a lone highway came into the evening cold and gray. To a chasm vast and deep and wide, the old man crossed in the twilight dim. The sullen stream had no fears for him. But he stopped when he was safe on the other side, and he built a bridge to span that tide. Old man said a fellow pilgrim near, you're wasting your time building here. Your journey will end with the ending day. You never again will pass this way. You've crossed that chasm deep and wide. Why build you this bridge in the evening tide? The builder lifted his old gray head. Good friend in the path that I have come, he said. There followeth after me today a youth whose feet must pass this way. This chasm, which has been naught to me, to that fair-haired youth may a pitfall be. He too must cross in the twilight dim. Good friend, I'm building this bridge for him. Thank you for listening to my snippet of his life. I pray that Roy and his life will continue to be an example for all of us. Let's honor him by telling the stories, sharing the memories, and in the coming weeks and months, coming around and loving Jane the way he would want us to. Thank you. I'm Hannah. I'm Uncle Roy's niece. Two nights ago, I was putting my daughter to bed, and I told her, as I often do, I looked her right in the eye and I said, you're my treasure. And then I paused, and I remembered who had first told me those words and where I had first heard those words. I said, you, you know, who first told me that? Uncle Roy. He looked down at the little ones, all you little ones, and say, what a treasure. Uncle Roy knew what was truly precious in life, and he treasured his family and his friends and his loved ones, just as we treasured him. Haley wrote this testimony that I'm about to read to her father, and I'd like to read it on behalf of the family um, for Haley and Jane and Tabitha and all of us. And Haley is one of the most humble, beautiful people on this planet, and when you hear these words, you'll see why she is just beautiful inside and out. These are Haley's words. My father was a builder. Many in the community knew of the work he produced. His employees and his colleagues can attest to his work ethic. He left a legacy a footprint in this wonderful community that took decades to produce. He also built our family home, a safe haven for us as children, his wife, and in later years for his grandchildren. These are tangible ways he demonstrated his character, his dependability, and his dedication. As he built our home, he wanted to have an arch above the entryway with a keystone at the centerpiece. He explained to me the importance of this piece both historically and for the integrity of the structure. A keystone is a central stone at the summit of an arch, securing the whole together. My father was also the silent builder of our family. Imperceptibly, through many years, a strong foundation was laid. Now that his time on earth is finished, his creation is fully revealed. My father was the keystone of his life's great work. He is the heart nestled into the archway we enter into as a refuge when the storms of life emerge, a place we can return to, to gather and honor the memories we collected together and now protect as our own. Scripture consoles us with these words and reminds us of the people who showed us Jesus by their living example. 
and Uncle Roy was one of those gentle people in my life. Ani Jane chose two scriptures for us to read, and this first one is from Psalms. And she said that this verse was brought to mind because of an anthem that our choir has sung many times, A Lord Built House. Hear the words of Solomon from Psalm 127. It is called a song of ascents, ascending, which is fitting for what we celebrate today. Unless the Lord builds the house, its builders labor in vain. And also the words of Matthew chapter 7. Therefore, anyone and everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. This is the story of the wise and foolish builders. Maybe, may we all be as wise as the builder and the loved ones who go before us. Thank you, Uncle Roy, for all of your love. God of love, we thank you for all with which you've blessed us even to this day. For the gift of joy and days of health and strength. For the gift of your abiding presence and promise in days of pain and grief. We praise you for home and friends. For our baptism and place in your church. And all those who have faithfully lived and died including our brother and friend, Roy. Above all else, we thank you for Jesus, who knows our griefs, who died our death, rose for our sake, and who lives and teaches us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, the song is Sweet By and By, another favorite of the family. We're going to stand, and we're going to sing this as we close our service.
peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessings of God Almighty, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.